Hello, my dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and welcome you to this week's edition of the St. Jude Parish Chatter. Of course, I'm here with Deacon Joe. Hello, Deacon Joe. Howdy. And Deacon Joe, we are not alone today. Who has come to be with us? Oh, Father Eugene. Father Eugene, would you like to say hello to everybody today? Hello, dear friends of Jesus. Good afternoon. So, well, Eugene will be with us at all of our masses here at St. Jude this weekend. We're doing the Mission Cooperative Program, and Father Eugene comes from Cameroon. So he's come a long ways mm -hmm. in order to be with us. And um, Deacon Joe, you've traveled somewhat internationally too. Do you have any any stories you could tell us about what it's like to travel a long ways across the world? Well, it's it's pretty pretty cool. I mean, I've been to uh, uh, Italy a couple of times. Been to Belize. Uh, I've been to Hawaii, which is the opposite way. Still in the United States, but still a long way. So sometimes I'm uh, uh, amazed at the uh, misconceptions people people have, both that I have about the uh, country I'm going to, but how they have about about us. Uh, I have one one quick story. I met some Canadians in Hawaii, and uh, they found out we were from Texas and asked us if we had an oil well in the backyard. <laughs> I can relate to having misconceptions about people. I, I, for my 40th birthday, I was able to fly through Dubai, and I had the misconception that Dubai was going to be a scary place for a priest to go to because, well, um, yeah, not every place in the world is is uh, real receptive to receiving Catholic priests, and I thought Dubai would be one of those. And I arrived in Dubai and saw priests and sisters walking around in habits and their clerics. And that kind of surprised me. I was also surprised to see that there were very little things to be afraid of in Dubai. So I'm a little embarrassed to have to tell that story that I had such a misconception about um, uh, the experience of life in Dubai. How about you, Father Eugene? Tell us about your experiences of traveling internationally. Wow, it's amazing, Father, to hear you and your own witnessing. I'm surprised they didn't ask uh, or uh, they didn't tell Dick and Joe that he had a gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Coming I had my six-shooter on me. <laughs> coming from Texas, even me, just visiting here in Texas, when I visit other parts of the United States, and I say, I'm, I'm, I'm living in Texas for the time being, they say, hey, have you been able to acquire a gun? <laughs> <laughs> so there, are even mis there are even those conceptions that we may call misconceptions even in the United States of America about other states. How about the conceptions of Cameroon? What do people in the United States often think about people who live in Cameroon, Father? Uh, the first thing I realized uh, years ago when I first visited in the United States was that everyone I tried to invite to come visit with me in Africa. The first thing they thought or they expressed was about lions and then snakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's what they have in their mind. It's like you come out in Africa in the morning, the first uh, thing you see is a lion. And it dawned on me that in Africa, especially the little children, all they think about America is money. It's like money walks the street in America, just as Americans think lions walk the streets in Africa. Mm -hmm. And so I think put everybody straight. Are there lions around in Africa or can you live your whole life without ever seeing an, a, a lion in Africa? Like me, I tell them the first time I saw a lion ever in my life was at a zoo in America. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Not in Africa. And my father died at the age of 88, and he never saw a lion. My mom is 86. She has never seen a lion. So I'm the only one in my family who has seen a lion. <laughs> and I'm coming from Cameroon, where there are lions. And said everybody straight about the, the snakes. Do you ever see poisonous snakes in, in Africa? Yeah, I've had, a, I've had an experience because we do a lot of hiking. Uh, as priests, you walk sometimes very long distances. I've been used to doing eight hours. And sometimes <laughs> I've slept on a snake mm. because you sleep on a, in a, on a mattress, in a mattress bed that, I mean, um, grass mattress. And rats can hide in the, in, in the mattress and then snakes come to hunt the rat. Yep. And you are not careful, they could also hunt you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So I was tired and I slept and I felt there was a lump 
I was tired, so I didn't care. I slept. The following day, I realized the lamb was moving. <laughs> and I alerted my host. And they came, opened the mattress up, killed the snake. You know what they did with it? No. They ate it. <laughs> well, you know, they eat rattlesnakes in Texas. <laughs> yeah, right. but I, I come from a tribe where that is uh, like a taboo. And so <laughs> oh, yeah. I started being very careful whatever they served me with during that visit. <laughs> that, that's that's great. It. <laughs> Thank you, Father Eugene. So you need that. to visit Africa to correct some of those misconceptions, just as we need to visit in America to correct our own misconceptions. Yeah. There's something about travel that makes the world smaller and brings mm -hmm. us all together, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Deacon Joe, tell us more about the sponsor for this week. All right. Well, our sponsor, you've already mentioned it once, is the Mission Cooperative Program, where once a year, someone like Father Eugene comes in and tells us about their mission and how we can best support them. So 10% of the offertory this weekend will be going to support Father Eugene's mission and the, the work of Catholic University of uh, Cameroon. So Father Eugene, maybe this is a good time for you to tell us, what is the Catholic University of Cameroon? The Catholic University of Cameroon was founded in 2010 by the bishops of the English speaking sector of Cameroon. Cameroon comprises 258 tribes and they speak different languages. So we were colonized by the French and then the English. And that's why we speak French, predominantly French. 80% is French speaking. So you find French spoken all over the national territory of Cameroon. And then the minority of 20% speaks English. That's about 8 million. Cameroon is about 32 million people. And it was at first a German colony. After the First World War, when the Germans were ousted, the country was split into two between the French and the English. And the English ruled their own part as part of Nigeria, which was their territory for the United Kingdom. And in 1960, the French speaking part of Cameroon gained independence from France. And Nigeria gained independence from the United Kingdom. Then there was this little portion that was now English speaking, neither belonging to Nigeria nor to Cameroon. So they considered it too small to be an independent country, which was the mistake then. So they asked them if they would like to join, remain in Nigeria or go back to Cameroon. After the, the referendum, they voted to go back to Cameroon, the southern part, the northern went to Nigeria. But since 1960, the marriage has not worked. Mm. Yeah, and well, in, in 2016, there have been really, when you visit Cameroon, you find there's marginalization of the English speaking part, the minority, because the French, the predominantly French government wanted sort of uh, to assimilate, you know, the French policy of assimilation, to assimilate these people rather than they had come together as a federation. Within time, the federation was scraped off and Cameroon became the United Republic. Then later on became the Republic and the idea of the Federal Republic of Cameroon disappeared. And these two people have different sub uh, systems of education and of the law. So they come together with common law and civil law. These two do not match. In one part, you are guilty before you prove yourself guilty. In another part, <laughs> you are not guilty until you prove. So these two come together difficult to live as a country. And the education system is different. So along the line, things have not moved on well. And in 2016, there were protests from the lawyers and from the teachers that the Cameroon government should stop sending French speaking magistrates to arbitrate over law cases in the English system, which is different. We have the common law. So let me, let me just ask for clarification. Is the the university then, the Catholic University of Cameroon, it doesn't have that old of a history. It began in 2016. Is that correct, Father? No, 2010. I'm giving this history because it was founded as a correction to this situation where the, the English-speaking students got stranded in Cameroon. They got to, to the French-speaking side, which is their country, but they are not treated. They, they study in English, but they're Nobody cares. They teach them in French 
and they find difficulty studying uh, in higher education in the country. A mm. good number started going to Nigeria and getting out of the country. So every time we produce students from high school, they have to get out of the country. If they are going to continue with their education. So the bishops sat together and said, we have to help this. So they founded the Catholic University of Cameroon to attend to the English speaking students in their own country. How many students do you have at the university there? Presently, we have 1,028 students. 1,028 students. And how did you become associated with the students, Father? How did you come to know the Catholic University of Cameroon? The English-speaking sector of Cameroon comprises five dioceses. And my diocese, Diocese of Kumbu, is one of those five dioceses. And all these dioceses, they contribute priests to the Catholic University. So they own the university, the bishops. They do the same for the major seminary that takes care of the formation of priests for this ecclesiastical province. So I was one of those contributed from the Diocese of Kumbu to the Catholic University. And how many years ago was that that you began the, the assignment of going from the diocese to work at the university? Unfortunately, it was a year the war started. Oh, wow. And I'm here actually because I was shot on the neck. No kidding. How is your neck today, Father? It healed very fast. I was shot on the 10th of February, 2022. And the Bishop of Beaumont, Bishop Toops, when I was studying at the Catholic University of America in Washington, he was serving at the Bishop's Conference. He had just completed his own studies in Rome. So we got to know each other and became friends. So when I was shot, he heard and he worked with my bishop to get me out of the country immediately because they were afraid. I was shot on the neck and on the jaw and I was bleeding. I was ambushed. They thought I was a, a government official. So the separatists, because this, what the story I was telling you led to war and the war is still going on. More than 5,000 people have been killed but you don't get it out here in the news. You come out here and you're losing people every day and nothing is said in the United States about it. So the, those who shot me, they realized the mistake. They realized I was a priest and they were the ones who took me to the hospital. <laughs> the ones who shot you took you to the yes, hospital. Yes, that was the paradox. Of it. <laughs> <clears throat> oh my, oh my. Yeah. And Father, tell us more about your vocation story. How did you end up becoming a priest? I wanted to be a priest at the age of four because there was a retired bishop, a Dutch man, <laughs> Bishop Jules Peters, who chose my village. My village, I'm the 14th priest from my village, a village of about 8,000 people. We are, we, we are so Catholic. I grew up not knowing there was anything beside the Catholic church. And this year alone, we had three priests from my village alone, three. Out of the 10 that were ordained in my diocese, three are from my village. So I grew up with priests and our home is just next door after the church. So I hated school. <laughs> Unfortunately, my father sent me to school too early. I was barely three and a half and there was no kindergarten. To go to elementary school at three and a half was too early. And I hated it. So when he went to work, I went back home. And the bishop realized there was this man chasing this little fellow with a whip every morning. No sooner does he pass to go to work than the little fellow goes back to the house. And this went on until the bishop started intercepting me. Not to were send me back to school. Fellow? Who was the little fellow? Were, were I, was the little little fe I was the little fellow. <laughs> <laughs> so he in intercepted me, but took me to his garden. Now, when, when, everywhere I go, I always plant flowers and because he cultivated that in me. He took me to his garden. I joined him to weed. I didn't speak good English, but I understood him and he managed to understand me. And we managed like that. After that, he would give me cookies, candies, uh, empty containers of tobacco, those type of things a village boy would love. And a, a relationship, a very intimate relationship, which unfortunately we cannot more have today because of the circumstances in which we live, developed between the two of us. And he started taking me out to our station mission. We had 38 our stations for three priests. That's why he retired in order to help until he got a priest to come and take his place before he went back home. So in the end, 
I wanted to be like him. And that's why I'm a priest today. What a great story, Father. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful that you're coming to St. Jude Perry this weekend, and we are grateful for the opportunity to be able to support the Catholic University of Cameroon. Unfortunately, our podcast time is coming to an end, but we're looking forward to hearing more at all of the Masses this weekend. Thank you for proclaiming the word to us, and may the the Amistad, the, the friendship between uh, our parish and Catholic University of America begin with this podcast, and may it continue for much time to come. Thank you so much, Father. Father, may we have your blessing before we go? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you for having called us to serve in the church founded by your Son, with so much love on his blood. We ask you to give us the graces we need to also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, and to continue to reach out in the manner of the Good Shepherd to those who have not yet joined in this wagon of salvation that takes us to your kingdom. Thank you for your priest at St. Jude. Thank you for the Catholic University. And thank you for the time you have given to us to meet and to share your gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.